All right, well, thank you for the songs this evening. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 13. So we're continuing our series through the book of Genesis. This is message number 14 in the series, entitled, A Lot of Not, and not on the end is spelled with a K, and a rope, that kind of not, a lot of not. Get uh, this 13th chapter, and start here with verse number one. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. Now, the exact beginning of the Phrygian kingdom in the region of Anatolia in modern-day Turkey is debated among scholars, but it was certainly in existence by the 8th century B.C. Its capital was the city of Gordium, which is about 50 miles southwest of modern-day Ankara. There is a legend pertaining to this kingdom that at one point the kingdom was without a king. And so there was a Phrygian prophet who declared that the next man driving an ox cart into the city would be the king. Now, as these things usually go, the next ox cart driving man to enter the city was a peasant farmer. Uh, His name was Gordius, and he was immediately declared to be the king of Phrygia. Now, the farmer's son was so excited about this that he tied up his father's ox cart to a post with uh, an intricate knot, and he dedicated this cart to Zeus, though the Phrygians called him by a different name. Now, later, the Roman historian Rufus described the knot as being several knots all so tightly entangled that it was impossible to see how they were fastened. Well, the Phrygians would eventually be ruled by the Persian Empire until Alexander the Great arrived there in the 4th century BC. And at the time, the ox cart was still tied to the post in the palace of the former kings. And Alexander learned that there was a prophecy concerning this ox cart that stated that any man who undid this knot would rule all Asia. And it was pretty well agreed that Alexander did undo this knot, but how he did it is somewhat uh, disputed among historians. Uh, One account says that after fooling um, with the knot for a little while, Alexander drew his sword and he cut the knot in two. And another account says that he pulled the linchpin out of the pole and then easily untied the knot. Now, some details of this whole account are certainly mythical, um, legendary, Um, but it seems that there was indeed some kind of intricate knot that Alexander the Great, he undid by some means when others before him had failed to undo it. Now, regardless of the details and such of this whole story, it has actually given us a metaphor that we use when referring to the Gordian Knot. So a Gordian knot refers to any sort of complex or unsolvable problem. And to cut the knot is to easily solve such a problem by removing constraints. Now, from one point of view, cutting the knot is ingenious. All these people are trying to untie it. Alexander takes the sword and just cuts it in two. The knot's gone, and hey, he's he's fulfilled the prophecy. From another point of view, cutting the knot, well, that's cheating. It violates at least the spirit of the rules, if not the letter of them. But we'll have to um, leave that for others to sort out. But there is a real Gordian knot in Scripture. And it first begins to be tied right there in Genesis chapter number 12. And that chapter gave us the first promises of God to Abraham and also the first challenges that seemed to threaten the fulfillment of those promises and make that fulfillment impossible. 
Well, this actually, in Genesis 12, introduced a theme that will continue throughout the rest of the Bible, and that is the challenges or the, the seeming impossibility of God's promises to Abraham being fulfilled. Now, God promised a name, a nation, and a land to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as an everlasting possession, but there are continual obstacles and hindrances to the fulfillment of that promise. So it begins in Genesis chapter number 12, but then it is amplified throughout the Pentateuch as Israel is trying to get to the land and one problem after another is hindering and, and preventing and seeming to threaten them from ever gaining possession. But it's also continued in the history of the conquest, in the books of, of Joshua and, and, and Judges later. And, and even then later, after Israel is in the land, there are some serious problems to them remaining there. And so this Gordian knot reaches its most difficult, most graphic form in Ezekiel's Valley of the Dry Bones. Israel has corrupted their way before God. They have broken God's covenant. And Israel is a valley of dry bones. And God asks, can these bones live? Well, that is a real Gordian knot for Ezekiel. And he doesn't know how to answer it. He doesn't know how to undo it. Well, Paul also much later grapples with this knot in Romans chapter 9 to 11, where he owns that Israel has been set aside because of unbelief, but he says, if they're cast off forever, then God's word fails, and God fails to keep his word. In fact, he wouldn't be God. So Paul recognizes that unless physical descendants of Jacob are gathered and restored to this very land promised to Abraham, and in this promised land of Canaan, that God's word has failed. And in fact, if that is the case, there's no one of us that has any hope in salvation. Well, throughout history, some have tried to cut this Gordian knot, uh, and they've tried to cut it by what is known as replacement theology. You may or may not be familiar with that term. Uh, those that hold that position generally eschew that term. They do not like it and do not uh, ever want to own being replacement. Uh, some prefer supersessionists. Some prefer, prefer fulfillment theology. There's a number of different, different terms that have been thrown about. But essentially, this is the belief that the church has replaced, has superseded, has fulfilled the place of Israel so that national salvation and restoration to the land of promise are somehow spiritually realized in the church and have nothing to do with Jews in Jerusalem. Well, I should say that they have attempted to cut that knot, and they're not been successful because their view is exactly what Paul warned against as embracing the failure of God's word and the arrogance of Gentiles over Jews in Romans chapters 9 to 11. But that knot, that very difficult, tough, intricate knot begins to be tied in Genesis chapter 12 and here in chapter 13, following just adds more knots to the problem. So in Genesis chapter 12, not only was the problem presented, but the, but the solution was presented as well. So the, the fact that there's a problem, a seeming problem to the fulfillment of these promises is thematic. It just runs throughout Scripture. There's continually problems. There, there's, there's a problem seen in the fulfillment of this today. And think about through much of the history of the last 2,000 years, there's only been an Israeli state for less than, a, less than 100 years. So for, for much of that history, there wasn't even an Israeli state there in at least part of that land. And so this, this seeming problem continues and always has these obstacles, but the solution is thematic as well. And the solution is pr presented in chapter number 12 that over it all, over all these problems and over all these promises, there is the gracious and faithful, all-powerful God who will not let one of the least of his promises to fail and who intervenes in a host of different ways to preserve his word and to preserve his people. Well, of course, Paul points out in Romans that it is God's 100% absolute faithfulness to his promises 
that gives believers full assurance of justification and future glorification. So we don't want to let these chapters become so familiar to us that we're not impressed, that we're not comforted, that we're not strengthened by God's faithfulness to his word and to his people. And that certainly is easy to do. These are probably some of the more familiar chapters in all of the Bible to us. And also, we can read Romans 9 to 11, and we can hear Paul's heart breaking for his Jewish kinsmen in unbelief and realize that what is at stake as we read a chapter like Genesis chapter 12 is far more than Abraham losing his wife. Far more is at stake there than Abraham losing his physical life. Now, as we come to chapter 13, Abraham returns from Egypt and immediately plunges into another threat to the promises that God made. Now, I have talked a little bit about historical narrative as we have been working our way through Genesis, how how we are to read them, and I've mostly concentrated on how that they're ordered and, and selectively told in order to communicate what the Spirit reveals. So, um, they may not necessarily be chronological, um, and they certainly don't include everything in the, in the telling of them. But chapter 13 gives us another good opportunity to learn how to read and to interpret these historical narratives in the Bible. Now, historical narratives typically have three main parts, and you could get picky and, and divide this a little further than this, but Three main parts, typically, to a historical narrative. You have, first of all, the background or the setting. You have, secondly, the main event. And thirdly, the resolution. So the way that they function in in this historical narrative is, first of all, the background, the setting. So this is what sets up the account. It's, It's what gives us what we need to know in order to understand the account, in order to make sense of it. It gives us that necessary background information. And then we get to the the main event of the narrative. And the main event, it it can be an action. Sometimes it it can be an action that someone takes. It can be something that an action that happens. It could be something that is revelatory in that it's the reception of new information or it's some new command that comes for something to be done. But whatever that it is, it's inciting. So, So it leads to a necessary choice. And then we get that third part, which is the resolution. So this reflects the choice that's made or the action that is taken in response to whatever the main event of this narrative is. So the choice is made, and then the result is is given. And these are the three main parts of of an historical narrative in the Bible and and generally holds, holds pretty well true throughout. Now, the main point of... A historical account is usually in the choice and outcome part of the narrative. Not, it's not usually in the background, the, the setting up of it. Sometimes the accounts also will add narrator comments that are approving or disapproving of choices and actions in the account. Sometimes we don't get those at all. Sometimes we do get them. Sometimes um, they can they can be. Uh, there can be a lot of explanation and such that that's included there. But sometimes they don't. So we have to read these accounts with the primary point in mind. We have to pay attention to the way that it is presented. Um, a- again, mentioning the fact that that not all details are given. So the details that are given are, are important to this account to, to get the point across, whatever that that point is. So we have to pay attention to the way it's presented. We have to compare against other biblical teaching to determine right and wrong. Oftentimes, um, narratives also will hold characters in contrast, uh, and that way we can judge them. And um, that is the case here in Genesis chapter number 13. So to this point, as we come to Genesis 13, to this point we, we learn that Lot has continued with Abraham But there's a conflict among their herdsmen that sets up a choice between them, which leads to disaster later in Lot's case and blessing for Abraham. So as we look at this chapter, 
I uh, would break it up into three parts, verses 1 to 7, where we see conflict in the land. Verses 8 to 13, where the choices are presented. And verses 14 to 18, where God's promises are confirmed. So we'll begin with the first part, where there's conflict in the land. And let's read verses 1 to 4. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hyde, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So saying that Abraham went into the south is referring to the southern part of the land of Canaan, though it is north of Egypt. So he goes up from Egypt, which which is an an ascent and elevation, as I understand, but also it is going north, but he's going into the south um, of the land of Canaan. Now Lot was introduced to us in chapter 11 in verse number 27, and then we are told that he went with Abraham when he set out for Canaan in chapter 11 and verse number 31. So we get that little introduction to Lot there, and, and, and we sort of just set him aside. Uh, and then when we come to chapter 13, now we pick, pick Lot back up, and he's going to feature uh, a little more in Abraham's story. So we learned that he has continued with Abraham all the way down into Egypt and now all the way back to the land of Canaan. And Abraham returned, we're told, to Bethel or, or to close to the place of Bethel, where he had been previously, and he continues to worship God. Verses 5 to 7. And Lot also, which went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So the the account informs us that both Lot and Abraham were prosperous, that both of them had great substance. And there's a point made um, that the Canaanite and the Perizzite were then inhabiting the land of Canaan. Now, presumably then, this reference to the inhabitants of the land of Canaan would mean that they had the best pasture lands for themselves there in in the land of Canaan where they were. Abraham and Lot then were left to um, fend from less desirable, less productive land with with great herds that they had to support and sustain. So this became a problem as there was a controversy between their herd hands uh, arguing over the same limited resources. And this is all just set up for what follows. But it does present difficulty for Abraham in the land of Canaan once again. So as we as we get to the next part, we see the choices that are presented. So let's look at verses 8 and 9. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So we see Abraham taking the action in in the account. He presents a solution. And he presents a solution that that seems to have um, a a mutual peace between them um, at at its core. In other words... He presents a solution that seems to have mutual interests in mind, and he offers um, this choice to Lot. Now, uh, when you read some commentaries, and I read a number of those commenting on on some of these verses, and they they wanted to condemn Abraham here um, and asserting that, you know, well, he was willing to just give away the promised land. Um, I don't really agree with that assessment. I I think it goes beyond um, what is written here, and and I don't even see how Abraham could give away um, the promised land when when he had never possessed it. Um, the only bit of ground, in fact, that he ever owned was the cave for burial that he bought for a very high price after that Sarah had died. I believe rather the key that's being presented to us in this account as we look at it is the contrast. 
So there's, there's this conflict between the herdsmen of, of Lot and Abram that, that sets up this, this conflict and this, this choice that they come to. How does each man navigate this? How does, how does each man respond to this? And so in response, Abram seeks a solution that's going to be mutually beneficial, one that's, that's going to preserve peace between them. And he even states, we're brothers. We, we're, we're close kinsmen. We, we're both obviously um, strangers, foreigners in, in this land, and, and we ought, there ought not to be conflict between us, not strife between us, but let there be peace between us. So in other words, he's willing to let Lot have his choice of the best of the land, and, and he's willing to take what is left in order to preserve that peace and to seek a mutually beneficial choice. And I really believe that's the contrast between that and Lot, because then we see Lot's choice coming in the next verses. And that's verses 10 to 13. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So in these verses, we see that Lot was given this choice, and Lot, in fact, made this choice, and he chose this plain that tended toward Sodom. So, in other words, this contrast is set up. Lot, Lot doesn't give any um, evidence that he is seeking any sort of a mutual benefit. Rather, Lot saw and seized the opportunity that was going to be best for him, what was going to be most conducive to his prosperity. That was the choice that he was given. And, and you might say, well, Abraham gave him the choice. Take the right hand, take the left hand. Um, you choose which way you want to go. And, and that's what Lot did. He looked up and he, and he saw and he chose what was best and he chose that for himself. And of course, Abraham was, was uh, obviously willing to, to offer that and to cede that um, to him. So he chose the more physically prosperous route without a view of where it could or would lead. So he, he looks at a place that looks to be a place where he can flourish and thrive, a, a place where he can increase, a place where um, he can live more comfortably. So if we're examining Lot's choice in terms of wisdom, like in um, the book of Proverbs, for instance, if we're examining his choice in terms of wisdom, then we see that Lot is exercising folly because he is considering the more immediate and the more short-term effects of this choice, whereas wisdom considers the end. Wisdom considers the long road. Wisdom considers the outcome as far as, as is possible into the future. And wisdom is going to tend toward um, the wisest choice in that regard, not the mere, more immediate, short-term gains. Now, as we look at this set of verses... These verses are loaded with marks of disapproval of Lot's choice. I mean, this, you know, there's just flags right and left just flying as you read these verses, which also shows us that this is obviously the point that is being driven at. So we get editorial comments here. In fact, we get two particular editorial comments. Verse 10, we get this reference to the Lord destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, obviously, this happened much later after Lot's choice was made to go towards Sodom. We get the second editorial comment in verse number 13, which speaks and highlights the wickedness of the Sodomites. In fact, not only is it mentioned, but it's actually described in multiple terms. So it is described as being, as the Sodomites, as being morally evil, a word also that means criminal. And then those two described as being exceeding or abounding or abounding or, or um, you know, over excessive. So there, there's no way that we can misunderstand that this was a bad choice that Lot had made. So the mentions of Sodom and Gomorrah also with Zoar, 
Zoar mentioned, which is where Lot fled the destruction of those cities. And of course, that comes up a little bit later. We also get this reference to the garden in Eden, and we get this reference to the land of Egypt. Now, when you put those together and sort of take the positive from them, you're, you're getting this visual of a, a lush and, and fertile land where one could prosper. But Lot's move, we're told, was toward Sodom. So again, we have all, all of these comments and all of these flags that are, that are given that this is a bad choice. And then finally, we're told Lot moved toward Sodom. Well, then we see the outcome in verses 14 to 18 in terms of Abraham, where God's promises are confirmed to him. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now, rather than approval being given to Abraham in the form of, of narrator comments, we get confirmation of God's promises to Abraham. In other words, an, an approval of his choice and actions. So as we read this account, we're obviously intended to continue to read, regard Abraham as acting in faith. And again, we get great commentary um, on the actions of Abraham in Hebrews chapter number 11, even though it's, it is somewhat brief considering how much material we have on Abraham in, in the book of Genesis. But, but we do get good commentary. We should regard the actions of Abraham as those of faith and understand them to be exemplary for us. So the confirmation comes with also an expansion of the promises. So he says, like in verse 15, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. Now he's getting a little more specific. He told him to look north, south, east, and west, and, and all this land that, that you see, I will give you this land. But he adds, and to thy seed forever. So the land of Canaan itself is going to be given even more specific boundaries as we, as we go on in its description to Abraham. But it is given to Abraham and to his seed forever. Now, of course, Abraham never possessed this land during his lifetime, which tells us that he will possess it in his inheritance in the life to come. His seed being the nation that would come from him through Isaac and Jacob, as we, as we learn later. Furthermore, God promises to multiply Abraham's seed to a numberless extent, and this is while Abraham is still yet childless and has a barren wife. Now, God instructs Abraham to arise, to walk through the land, and so Abraham's feet would tread on dust that was numbering his descendants. And his walk mimics the sort of a boundary walk of one that has legally acquired land. And I've uh, read that oftentimes in, in, in this time in, in antiquity um, that when kings would come into power that they would oftentimes walk, at, at least sometimes they would do it um, just more in a ceremonial manner, just as a, as a manner of, of taking possession officially and, and advertising that possession of the land. And so Abraham's walk does seem uh, perhaps in some ways to, to mimic that sort of a walk because he's to walk throughout the land. And ultimately we're told that he settles in Hebron, which was uh, just south of Jerusalem. So the problem in chapter 12 arose through a famine, through a scarcity problem. And it's actually the opposite here in chapter number 13. The problem in chapter number 13 is driven by prosperity. 
by abundance, by having a great amount of substance. So we should not think that trials of faith only involve painful suffering, adversity, and want. We oftentimes associate pain, adversity, scarcity, lack. We associate those sort of things with trials of faith very readily. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't limit it to that. Those, our faith is tested in those ways. But faith is also tested in prosperity. And we certainly see that here in the case of Abraham and Lot. In fact, prosperity can tempt us to self-sufficiency and self-reliance. In fact, Israel was warned repeatedly, when you come into this land, they, they were going to come into an abundant land. They were going to inherit houses they hadn't built. They were going to drink out of wells they hadn't dug. They were going to eat from gardens and vineyards that they never planted, never cultivated. And all of this, all this rich blessing was going, they were just going to walk into it one day. And he said, when you come there, beware. Take heed. Be very careful that you don't forget the Lord that brought you into this good land. And Scripture is full. The wisdom literature, even later in, in the New Testament epistles, uh, in many of the, the words of Christ, there are many warnings against riches, the deceitfulness of riches, prosperity, and the danger that it can be to the soul. So prosperity is certainly a place where our faith is tested. And I, and I realize how it is oftentimes. We feel like that uh, our faith is oftentimes more tested in adversity. And we think, you know, hey, maybe I'd like to try a little bit of that prosperity testing for a while. You know, give me a, give me a break. But it really truly is a place of testing where we do have to be careful. Prosperity can tempt us to greed and to the lust for more. Prosperity can tempt us to misery, the, to misery rather, the, the clutching of, of resources and a refusal of generosity that we are commanded to show. Prosperity is oftentimes misinterpreted as the approval of our choices and actions. Oftentimes we, we think how well our bank account or our retirement fund or, or how well uh, our, our refrigerators are stocked or whatever, oftentimes we think of, of many of, of these things as signs of approval that I must be doing the right thing as though I have merited God's favor. This is why there's warning after warning after warning to us in times of prosperity to be careful. And so the, the tests for Abraham come in both scarcity and prosperity in these two chapters. Now the mention of the Garden of Eden here in this chapter gives us a subtle reminder that environment is not our problem, environment is not our savior. It's not a problem. It's not a solution. Sodom and Gomorrah was filled with people who descended from Adam and Eve, who started out in the Garden of Eden where there was no sin and where all his needs were provided for. And yet Scripture uh, just piles on the multipliers of how wicked the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. Now, the picture of faith in this chapter is certainly vivid. We see on the first hand, we see the faithfulness of God as, it, as he confirms his promise to Abraham, and he expands that promise as he's revealing more of that promise to Abraham, and he will continue to do so as we proceed in Genesis. The faith of Abraham is seen once again in keeping God's word and in trusting him. Abraham is, is not presented to us as being panicked or greedy, or worried. He's not presented to us in that light at all. He's presented to us as, as very calmly and, and, and patiently um, seeking lots good and seeking peace between them, willing to take, willing gladly to take the lesser land. Um, so that's the way that Abraham is presented to us. In other words, if these are the actions of faith, then Abraham is trusting God. God has promised him this land. He don't, he don't have to try to seize it. He don't have to try to wrest control of it um, from Lot. He doesn't, he doesn't have to do anything like that. And once again, we see in this chapter how that God's promises 
are, are proven safe and trustworthy. One of the recurring themes in Scripture is how that those that put their trust in the Lord will not be ashamed. Why? Because he will not fail to keep his word. If you are trusting in the promises of God, then you are trusting in the most sure thing in all of the universe. All right, that's all of our message for this evening. We will close with a hymn.